Idiotic and dangerous, Iran mocks the US for imposing sanctions on its supreme leader and says hopes for diplomacy have gone. Do sanctions work and what's needed to break this cycle of escalating rhetoric between Washington and Tehran? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The White House has lost its mind. That's how Iran's president described the latest round of US sanctions against his country. Years of restrictions have severely dented the Iranian economy. Now, President Donald Trump is targeting Iran's supreme leader and his military chiefs. He signed an executive order on Monday denying them access to financial resources. The sanctions are designed to punish Tehran for what the U.S. calls its destabilizing activities in the Middle East and to prevent it from developing nuclear weapons. But Iranian leaders say that Washington has closed the door on diplomacy. They are suffering from mental disability. The White House is afflicted by mental retardation and does not know what to do. This means the certain failure and defeat of the United States. I do not have any doubt about that from a political viewpoint. No wise person would do what they're doing these days. I feel that there is severe frustration and a big confusion among the U.S. leaders and the White House. Well, the U.S. National Security Advisor says the door remains open for talks with Tehran. If Iran gave up its pursuit of nuclear weapons, its uh, ballistic missile uh, development program, which is designed to create delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons, if it gave up its support for terrorism, if it stopped its other uh, malign activities across the region, we'd be very happy. Secretary Pompeo last year gave a speech where he listed 12 things. I've given you four. It's sort of an expanded list. That's the end game we want. So let's bring in our panel for today's discussion. Joining us now from Tehran is Mustafa Kosheshem, journalist and political commentator from Vienna, Mari Godzi, uh, economist at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, and from Washington, D.C., Ali Vyaz, director of the Iran Project at the International Crisis Group. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Ali, let's uh, start with you. Uh, is uh, Iran's president right? Has the White House lost its mind? Well, without any doubt, uh, the latest round of sanctions are absolutely counterproductive for an administration that pretends that it's interested in negotiations. To target the political leadership of Iran and to try to designate uh, Iran's foreign minister, Iran's chief diplomat, uh, it's really a signal that this administration is not interested in negotiations. Otherwise, it would not increase the political uh, price of engagement with it for the Iranians in ways that would actually render talks almost impossible. Marty Godzi in Vienna, um, what's the purpose, do you think, of these sanctions? Is it diplomatic? Is it economic? What effect are they intended to have? Well, to my humble opinion, I think it has uh, several consequences and several reasons. One of the reasons which, is, uh, which come to my mind easily is that uh, I think Mr. Trump is somehow annoyed with the message that uh, he received from the Japanese prime minister um, and that's that's one of the most obvious reasons, which, which I think is just uh, war of words. Uh, but the other reason could be, of course, economic reason. Um, well, we, we saw that Iran uh, is not able to sell its oil, and nowadays it's only selling about uh, 300,000 barrels per day. So its revenue uh, uh, to fill its budget uh, from the source of oil sale is much lower now. And the Iranian government has been trying to increase the taxation on somehow some semi-public companies in Iran. And as we, as we all know, as we economists know in Iran, that a uh, majority of semi-public companies like foundations, like executions, uh, they are somehow um, the head of these semi-public companies uh, are directly elected and selected by the supreme leader uh, once in a while. So. If uh, Mr. Trump imposes sanctions on the Supreme Leader, it means that all uh, companies, semi-public companies that are somehow organized by the, Supreme Leader, by the Supreme Leader are somehow paralyzed now. Even though these companies uh, do not have much trade or investment with uh, foreign entities in foreign 
uh, companies, these uh, semi-public companies are huge and large. For instance, the, uh, one of the most transparent uh, foundation in Iran is a uh, foundation of uh, revolutionary Mustaz Afin, which is um, a very huge and transparent company in Iran. It's one of the best, actually. But there are so, so many other foundations and also executions. For instance, the uh, execution of Imam's Order, which by some estimates, it is somehow uh, accumulating about 10 to 12 percent of the total capital in Iran. Another one is, for instance, Aslan Wats Rezavi. These companies are huge and they are controlling the uh, economy of Iran and they are exempted from tax. So I think the government of Iran was trying to get some taxation and some help from these companies. Okay. But we see that within these sanctions, uh, even though they're not uh, having trade relations or investment relations with other countries, we see that somehow it might affect them and it might affect okay. the uh, government budget. Mustafa Kosheshem, Iran says that all hopes for diplomacy have gone now. Uh, have these sanctions raised or diminished the prospect of a, of a military conflict? Well, uh, let's talk about the sanctions, what they are. Uh, you know, the sanctions on IRGC, the offices, office of the Iranian supreme leader and uh, affiliated companies and bodies, they have all, all, all already been under sanctions, especially the IRGC. They, they've been under several rounds of sanctions. The most comprehensive one was Qatar, and, uh, which was uh, pursued by uh, uh, labeling the IRGC as a terrorist organization that entailed uh, the harshest ever punitive action against the IRGC and affiliated companies, firms, offshore accounts, and companies abroad. So basically, the U.S. has never been short of sanctions to uh, go harsh against Iran. What they need to have is identifying these offshore accounts and companies and imposing sanctions would not help them in this regard. They have done already whatever they could. So uh, this would not bring them any new result. The only thing that seems to be interesting uh, and happens probably for the first time is imposing sanctions on Mr. Zarif. Well, this has a lot of meaning. First of all, they have placed him under the set of, same set of sanctions that have been put on IRGC, bringing them under one umbrella uh, pushing them closer to each other to stand against the United States and uh, uh, stressing that resistance now is the only option against the United States. That's the first result. They have killed any uh, diplomatic hope that they could have uh, for talks with Iran. And this shows that uh, their offer of talks has never been genuine. Also, you know that all throughout the last decade, there, were, uh, the, there was a minority who supported talks with the U.S. and a majority who criticized uh, talks with the U.S., believing that the U.S. is not for a conflict resolution, but wants to contain Iran's power components in various areas. Ever since Donald Trump rose to office, uh, the minority group has lost its stance, especially among the public. Now I feel there, is a change, there has been a change of view and they have developed a new set of worldview. Now also they believe that resistance and not talks uh, with the United States is uh, the only option. Uh, the majority group were worried all throughout the last decade uh, about behind the stage talks or track to diplomacy. But I believe now they can rest assured that there won't be any behind-the-stage talks, there won't be any track to diplomacy, okay. because the U.S. has shown that it's willing to uh, antagonize Iran and satisfy and appease Saudi Arabia and Israel. Uh, so, uh, basically, there won't be any okay. talks uh, for perceivable future now. Let's, let's put that to, to Ali. Uh, John Bolton says the door is open for Iran for talks at any time. But how can you maintain a line of dialogue with a country if you've sanctioned its foreign minister? The reality is that you can't, uh, and that's, uh, I think, something that John Bolton is uh, fully aware of. In fact, in 2017, he wrote an article in the National Interest uh, when he was out of uh, the Trump administration uh, and didn't have actually much access uh, to the White House. He put out a plan uh, to, uh, about how to kill the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, and how to isolate Iran and pressure Iran. 
And one of those elements was uh, that he emphasized that uh, he believes once uh, the U.S. withdraws from the nuclear deal that uh, the Iranians would not renegotiate it. But the U.S. should talk about uh, the possibility of talks uh, again. Uh, just as a way of scoring a point on the international uh, scene and basically making the U.S. look like the flexible party and Iran as the inflexible party at fault. Um, so I, I don't believe that uh, the Trump administration uh, is genuine and serious about negotiations. I think the president himself is interested, but uh, unfortunately he is surrounded uh, by a group of uh, Iran hawks uh, who are uh, deliberately and step by step goading him uh, towards a military confrontation with Iran. But, Masi, um, what is the U.S. administration's beef or those surrounding the president's beef with Iran? Why is Iran a malign actor in the region, according to those in the U.S. administration, when Saudi Arabia and the UAE are not? Well, you can see that from the past four decades, and you can see that since the Islamic Revolution, uh, Iran did not like to have a very good uh, relationship with the United States, and that is uh, somehow uh, deepening down in the history of Iran that we, we saw that there was a military coup or uh, somehow an organized coup by the CIA much earlier. And um, what, whatever we see that we see in the past four decades, there was only animosity. And Iran did not show, and also US, US did not show um, good faces to each other. Actually, since 1979, since 1980, U United States imposed crippling sanctions against Iran. And Iran also itself somehow self-isolated itself from the uh, international economy. Uh, so that being said, I think the only chance that United States could convince Iran to come to the negotiation table is uh, to give something to Iran. For instance, uh, United States uh, administration cannot somehow go back to the deal, of course, because it, it will show uh, somehow some sign of weakness, but at least it could offer something to Iran so that Iran can come to the table. For instance, by letting Iran to sell its oil, uh, that could be somehow a convincing uh, incentive for Iran to come to the negotiation table. All right, let, let's put that to uh, Mustafa in uh, Tehran. Of course, uh, this all started, I mean, uh, with the current administration in 2015, uh, with uh, President Trump wanting to rip up the, the, the nuclear deal. But has it moved beyond that now, do you think? Uh, uh, beyond a fear of, of Iran developing nuclear weapons? And, of course, Iran's foreign minister said again on Tuesday that Iran will never pursue uh, a nuclear weapon. But has it moved beyond that and to, to more... Uh, I don't know, an, an ideological difference over Iran's foreign policy. Is that what uh, is... Uh, is that the U.S.'s beef with Iran? Well, uh, you know, despite many who believe that uh, Donald Trump is moving along a different path from President Obama, I believe if we had a Hillary Clinton or an Obama administration in office now, uh, they would go uh, roughly the same path, but uh, with different techniques, of course. Uh, after trying to stage coup d'etats or well-built revolutions and uh, uh, imposing sanctions, even considering the military option in uh, 2002 and 2003, um, they, they came to realize that they may not topple the Islamic Republic, but they should develop a plan in order to contain Iran's, uh, you know, out, uh, Iran's power outside the border where uh, there is a clash of interests between the two sides and they develop the engagement for the sake of containment policy to impose harsh sanctions and pose credible military threat to force Tehran to the negotiating table. That's what uh, President Obama did and I believe that's what uh, Mr. Trump is doing. He is no different. He is trying to do the same, use sanctions, pose credible military threat to change the calculations in Tehran in order to uh, force Tehran to give more and more concessions in talks. Now, uh, the only difference is that President Trump is doing this, you know, strategy in a very inexperienced um, uh, way. And uh, uh, apparently, uh, the ones that are accompanying him, and he himself picked them up, like Mr. Bolton, Mr. Pompeo, uh, he picked them up for this very reason, to show that 
he is not afraid of waging war in order to make the threat, the military threat, credible. Uh, they, they are not moving along the same path of uh, the engagement strategy pretty well. Their moves sometimes are outside the specified framework, and uh, hence they've come up you know, with uh, no result. What they need to know is that this, this game has been exercised once. Iran now knows this game and the rules of this game, and they have decided to stand up because they know if they uh, are cheated again, if they are forced into talks under the same strategy, then this would continue on and on and on until Iran would lose all its power components in the nuclear industry, missile industry, regional power, and the list would continue. So this is no, not basically about nuclear bomb. If nuclear, uh, military nuclear capability mattered, then uh, the JCPOA was the best to ensure that all Iranian moves are under check. Okay. Uh, why did they rip it through? Why did Donald Trump discard uh, this nuclear deal? This shows that they, are, they do not want, as they have already stated, even Europeans have stated, they want everything, uh, I mean, all Iranian power components to weaken, and then they intend to roll back the growth of Iran in all these areas. OK, Ali Vez in, in Washington, I, mean, I want to get your reaction to that. And also, I mean, John Bolton spelled out his endgame on Tuesday, as we heard at the beginning of the programme. Uh, is what the US wants from Iran realistic? Why should the US be allowed to dictate to countries like Iran how it should be behaving in its own backyard, to dictate its foreign policy? Sure. Uh, look, first of all, I disagree with the uh, statement by uh, your other guest about uh, um, President Obama's policy, that if we had President Obama in place now, it would be uh, almost the same thing with different tactics. The reality is that coercive diplomacy is a tool of statecraft that a lot of countries use, and the United States, because of its dominance uh, in the global financial system, uses it maybe a bit too much. Uh, but the reality is that the Obama administration used the balance of carrots and sticks. Uh, in the case of the Trump administration, uh, they have put the carrots field on fire, and they're only using sticks. Uh, and even if they promise uh, uh, some incentives, I think they're, because of the erratic behavior of this administration, it will be entirely unreliable. And that's why they are not successful in using maximum pressure to advance their agenda, be it in the case of uh, Venezuela or in the case of North Korea or in the case of Iran. Uh, in terms of your question, I think the biggest problem that the United States has had with Iran over the past four decades is the fact that uh, it cannot tolerate uh, Iran's independent foreign policy. Um, the, uh, the countries in this part of the world, from the perspective of Washington, are either puppets or pariahs. There is nothing in between. Uh, and Iran is the only country uh, in this part of the world that can challenge uh, the U.S. and Israel's maneuvering space, uh, and that's what's intolerable uh, for the United States. Uh, and I think the reason that sanctions are being used uh, is not necessarily for behavior change, because as many in this administration have said repeatedly, they don't believe that the Iranian uh, regime is capable of changing its behavior. So they are, in fact, after regime change. Now, this is, again, as I said, does not apply to President Trump. Uh, but uh, again, he has now boxed himself in a position uh, that uh, sanctions are not going to uh, render Iran more amenable to negotiations or they're not going to alter Iran's behavior. And he's running out of things to sanction. So sooner or later, we would get into a stage uh, that he would have no choice other than taking military action, which would have disastrous consequences for Iran, for the U.S., and for the entire region. Makhdi, um, President Trump has boxed himself in, into a position. Is, is the U.S., is the administration losing the PR battle at the moment? Under these latest sanctions, would, would social media companies like Twitter be forced to close the account uh, of uh, Iranian politicians, like Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, for instance? I mean, is that even enforceable? Oh, well, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I, I've never thought about this. But when we're talking about sanctions, uh, U.S. sanctions, it should involve any activity that uh, that entity or that per person under sanction uh, is, on is doing. And that could be also relevant for Twitter accounts as well. And uh, I think, uh, as Ali also said, uh, U U.S. administration is pushing itself into a corner that uh, it doesn't allow Iran for any kind of 
uh, reaction. So, in fact, Iran should, uh, I mean, should resist. We've seen that uh, yesterday that Russia somehow is allowed uh, in the uh, Council of Europe, and it seems that Russian patients and also the other side's patients worked. And if Iran sees that, and if uh, uh, Iran wants to uh, continue its patience uh, strategy, I think it might become successful, but it will be very harsh because nowadays we see that the economic situation for Iranians is very is very bad and actually worse than any other years prior to this to these sanctions. And actually, these are unilateral sanctions. These are not multilateral sanctions that we think that uh, they have the most harm. But we see that they are uh, these sanctions are somehow ending to a war. Um, military war, because actually these are the economic war, and I'm I'm afraid that uh, that situation is somehow soon to come. So I hope uh, it's it's only my hope that there could be some change in strategy because Mr. Trump is a businessman and he knows how to bargain. So in order to bargain, you need to somehow increase your bargaining chips and power. I think uh, he managed to do that up to now, and so he needs to find a way to somehow incentivize Iran to come to the negotiation table. Uh, Mustafa Kosheshem, uh, Russia, of course, uh, uh, another country that, that, that pursues an independent foreign policy. On Monday, Moscow said that it would look to counter uh, these, uh, these new U.S. sanctions and that they might be illegal. To what extent is, is Russia uh, perhaps key to what happens next in this crisis? Well, uh, it's no secret that the Russians are a heavyweight, at least uh, in regional developments. Uh, it's more interesting to know that uh, the Russians have confirmed that the global hawk that was shut down uh, was in Iranian sky. Also, a very influential Chinese official was in Tehran. And a couple of days ago, in one of the meetings, he said that since Iran shut down the global hawk, now we are holding a very different view about Iran, because not just because of the courage that Iran has shown, uh, but also because of the homemade radar system as well as the missiles that uh, the missile that hit the uh, aircraft. Uh, it, it has shown much power and technology. Therefore, we are now thinking of getting closer to Iran strategically. Uh, let me add one more point. What uh, Mr. Weiss said was no rejection of what I said. I said uh, Mr. Trump is exercising the same strategy, but with different raw and inexperienced tactics. Uh, the fact that he doesn't know the balance between carrot and stick proves the same. He doesn't know the tactics. And he is ex exercising the same strategy. And it's no secret, uh, let's remember, that even President Obama defied undertakings under the nuclear deal. Re let's remember the case when he avoided vetoing uh, the uh, extension of ISA, or let's remember the unfulfilled promises of John Kerry with regard to the visa waiver program. So many promises he made to Mr. Zarif, and they never complied with their undertakings under the nuclear deal, because basically the road ahead uh, is to be the same. They are not going to comply with their, uh, with their undertakings, no matter it's an Obama administration or a Donald Trump administration. You know, these days, uh, Iran has wrapped up uh, and has arrived at the conclusion with regard to how to treat with the, uh, the United States. If there is something good about uh, Donald Trump, it's, it's about uh, the fact that he is showing uh, the United States foreign policy uh, naked. And this has caused Iranians to develop a single uh, stance against the United States. I believe if there is anyone that needs to uh, uh, revise the strategy and rethink uh, the stances that they've taken, it's the UAE, it's Saudi Arabia. They are playing in the same puzzle of the United States. They are helping them with the sanctions. They are providing them with you know, uh, uh, military facilities, runways and bases to uh, help them uh, with uh, aggression against Iran. This is going to cost the UAE, and I believe if this uh, uh, such a violation uh, of Iranian airspace or an attack on Iran ever happens, then Iranians would definitely show reaction to the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and any other nation that would help uh, the United States.
There, I'm afraid, gentlemen, we must end our discussion. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Uh, Mustafa Kasheshem, Marty Godsey, Godsey and uh, Ali Baez. And as always, thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle, at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.